From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Cronkite News. I'm Elena Mendoza, thanks for joining us. Tonight we highlight some of our top stories on the consumer beat. Stories about protecting the health and livelihoods of people across our state. When the topic of concussions arise, football often comes to mind. But are concussions a serious problem in other sports? Reporter Blake Bernard looks at youth ice hockey and its connection to the head injury. The physicality of ice hockey is extremely intense, and recently that has led to rule changes and increased awareness in youth hockey leagues. It's a real hot topic nowadays. It's nerve-wracking at times. Concussions in ice hockey are nearly as common as high school football and just as dangerous. You're always exposed. You could be falling down and a guy comes to hit you in the shoulder and he hits you in the head instead. A recent study published in the Journal of Pediatrics showed that younger adolescents who play ice hockey suffer from concussion symptoms for a much longer period than more physically mature players. Oh, their brains are developing, their bodies are developing. This concern has led to USA Hockey changing rules in recent years specifically raising the body checking age from 11 to 13. Up until five years ago, they'd start their checking at 11. So um, that's been a big difference. One place youth hockey players need to be incredibly careful is up against the boards. A lot of times they're checked and they crash into the surface. And when it's done drastically enough, it can lead to concussions. Following a big hit, if a player comes to the bench and is dizzy or nauseated, that is a huge red flag. Any type of mention of any of those symptoms after the contact, that player is done done for that session and typically will go get concussion tested. Prolonged issues can arise if a player comes back too soon. Any parent that would let their kid go back in shouldn't be a parent. It's something you go to a legitimate doctor and, and you make sure that all the symptoms are gone for a certain length of time. And coaches should also be on the alert. The biggest thing that coaches can do to help with the recovery process for concussions is sticking to the rule of if there's a concussion suspected that there's no same day return to play. Following baseline testing at places like the Banner Concussion Center, the player typically experiences limited action on the ice for a week or two before finally returning to contact play. In the Broadcast Center, Blake Bernard, Cronkite News. Arizona is now in peak flu season and a little later uh, than usual. With more than 5,000 reported cases, Cronkite News reporter Audrey Wheel shows us just how bad flu activity is in Arizona and why it's spreading. Every week, Walgreens releases a flu index, indicating which states and cities are being hit hardest by the flu. For the past three weeks, Arizona has ranked number one in flu activity, and Phoenix and Tucson now rank third and fourth respectively compared to the rest of the country. Health, of, health professionals admit it's hard to say why Arizona is suffering, but there are a few theories. I don't want them picking something up from someone else and I don't want them spreading it to anybody else either. Parents I spoke to at the park today said they always make sure their kids get the flu shot. And experts say it's a good idea for everyone to get vaccinated. Because when it comes to the flu, you just never know. The only predictable thing about flu is that it's unpredictable. Some people get the flu and they recover without any medications, without any treatment. Other people get the flu, and sometimes they're young, healthy adults. They'll get the flu, and they'll end up in the intensive care units. In Arizona, incidences of the flu peaked about a month later than usual, just in the last few weeks. It could just be that physicians or healthcare providers in one part of the country are testing more people for flu, um, or maybe it's hitting on the West Coast more than the East Coast, but it, it's really different every year. Dr. Natasha Bouillon said it could even be an effect of the weather. So some theories are because the weather is a little bit more warm this year, that's why it's peaking um, later. Dr. Bouillon says because of the mild temperatures, people don't have their heaters or air conditioners running, and the air can become stagnant. Another possibility? Flu vaccination rates are usually lower in Arizona than the rest of the country. But Sarah Mead isn't taking any chances. They pick stuff up seriously like every week they're sick with something new. So um, if there's something that we can avoid, I'd rather do that. The Department of Health Services says it tracks flu activity from October to September. So even though Arizona is seeing high activity now, cases of the flu can happen any time of the year. Audrey Wheel, Cronkite News. For patients far from their care providers, traveling to receive the care they need is not always easy. For patients with life-threatening illnesses, long-distance travel can be detrimental toward their health. Chloe Norquist has how a, a volunteer-based pilot program is helping the medical patients get from their home to the doctor's office. 
Hundreds of pilots across the western United States volunteer their time to help those who need a ride, including longtime pilot Dennis Phelan of Goodyear. We're going to fly a mission today where we're going to go over and pick up a, a husband and wife team and uh, bring them back here to Goodyear so he can uh, participate in his uh, cancer treatments. Dennis Phelan is a volunteer pilot for Angel Flight West, an organization that flies patients from their hometown to where they need to go. We do a wonderful service for people. A plane like this Piper Seneca 2 can take pilots like Dennis over 700 miles to pick up patients across bordering states. Today, Phelan is flying to the rural town of Daggett, California to pick up George Eastless and his wife. George is being treated for stage four cancer. I live just right here in Barstow, so we get on the plane here in Daggett, and boom, we're there, good year. And According to George's wife, driving to Arizona takes too much of a toll on his body. On this trip, Eastless will be undergoing chemo and radiation on three tumors. We're blessed to have him pick us up, drop us off. It's right there, you know, I couldn't ask for anything closer. God's blessed us for that. Phelan has been with Angel Flight for six years now and continues doing what he does because of the satisfaction he receives from transporting patients like George. It's so rewarding. It, it's, I would encourage as many people, if they have an interest, it's, it's so much better than the $100 or $200 hamburger. Um, you'll, you'll get a lot more satisfaction out of doing something like this. And that's what makes it all worth it to Phelan. In 2015, volunteer pilots made over 4,000 trips across 13 different states. The organization is based in Southern California and has been in operation since the 1980s. In downtown Phoenix, Chloe Nordquist, Cronkite News. A Phoenix teenager is fighting for the right to try experimental, life-saving drugs. And he took that fight to the nation's capital today. Cronkite News reporter Wafa Shahid takes us inside the Senate hearing. When Brophy Preparatory freshman Diego Morris testified about connecting patients to potential life-saving treatments today, it was more than just a hearing. When I was 11, my family and I had to leave the country and move to London to get a potentially life-saving treatment that wasn't available in the U.S. That treatment saved Diego's life, but some witnesses are still fighting for their lives. Laura McClin's testimony about her terminally ill son also hit home for many of those on the Senate committee. We were here for the, the speech. Sure. Speak. Because my son has a fatal disease, and so we're, he's in a fight with the clock for his life. And so there is a drug that exists that can slow the progression of the disease that my son has. So we need that drug sooner than later. The testimony all had a common message, increase access and expedite the process for patients to receive drugs that aren't approved in the U.S. You have the right to die when you're terminally ill? Fantastic, but what about those who want to fight? I want to see the process, the process get expedited and give families and patients the opportunity to save their own lives. Senators were in agreement that this is a bipartisan issue and one that needs more support. Just to give hope to patients and their families where they have no hope. This here is adjourned. Here <laughs> in Washington, Wafa Shahid, Cronkite News. Experts have found a new way to diagnose Lyme disease. Symptoms of the disease spread by ticks can often appear to be other syndromes leading to misdiagnosis. Reporter Lillian Simpson reports DNA sequencing may be the key. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Lyme disease has reached its highest infection rate in years with about 300,000 reported cases in the U.S. But even that number might be misleading. We believe that number to be way higher, more around 900,000 due to the misdiagnosis. Jessica Crawford was initially misdiagnosed and it almost cost her her life. I also had joint pain throughout my entire body, muscle stiffness so bad I could hardly take a deep breath, had heart palpitations, um, and insomnia, chronic fatigue, I mean, it, it just, it plagues you. Lyme disease is a tick-borne illness that if not treated correctly or in due time can cause severe complications. 
New York doctor Richard Horowitz treated Crawford and says he has helped more than 12,000 Lyme disease patients from all over the world. He says he's been treating patients from Arizona who were initially misdiagnosed. And there are people from Arizona who are getting this, who are being forced to go out of state and search for solutions because they just can't find solutions um, within the medical system here. However, that could all change in one day. Behind these closed doors, doctors, professors, researchers, and those affected met to raise awareness for Lyme disease. The organization Focus on Lyme and the Tejan Research Institute selected some of the top minds in science to meet here in Scottsdale to come up with a solution. A new DNA sequencing method could change the future of how Lyme disease is detected. So what we're trying to do through applying these next generation sequencing methods to detecting the pathogen and other pathogens that might be co-occurring. To be able to have for the very first time an accurate diagnostic tool and a tool to be able to show your progress for you to be able to show specific co-infections which are a big problem for most Lyme sufferers. Um, it's revolutionary and it's it's going to change the face of Lyme disease. Crawford hopes this will help others get the treatment they need more quickly. In Scottsdale, Lillian Simpson, Cronkite News. Thousands of Arizona patients with multiple sclerosis are not receiving the proper care that they require. Reporter Blake Bernard takes us into the life of a person with MS and the specific problem she is facing. Imagine living with a degenerative disease and the proper care is hours away. Well, many people with multiple sclerosis in rural Arizona areas are facing that exact problem. During that first year, I lost my ability to walk and then relearned how to walk. Mary Shaw has lived with multiple sclerosis for more than four years. I uh, do have numbness in my hands and arms, and I will all the time. In Arizona, there are around 3,500 people with MS in rural areas like Mary, who lives in Yuma. Because of their location, these patients struggle to get the care they need. We only have one uh, neurologist who accepts new multiple sclerosis patients. This is a, the third largest metropolitan statistical area in the state, and anyone here being diagnosed with MS has to go to that doctor. Many patients often wait months in order to see that one doctor. If they are able, which few are, they can travel hundreds of miles to Phoenix to see an MS specialist. An MS specialist would see probably within a month as many people with MS um, as a regular neurologist would tend to see in their normal course of practice in a year or more, maybe their whole career. Representative Kate Brophy McGee is chair of the House Ad Hoc Committee for Multiple Sclerosis, Awareness and Education with Shawl. So we're doing everything we can to raise the profile of the disease and educate uh, the public on what exactly it is. As the committee meets regularly to help create solutions, there are some ways for patients to improve their current situation. Acupuncturist and uh, massage can be really helpful. There are other things um, eating the right way. One potential solution both McGee and Shaw detailed was telemedicine, which would use telecommunication and technologies to provide a clinical health care at a distance. That, among others, are some of the solutions the committee will discuss in the upcoming months. Blake Bernard, Cronkite News. The Capitol Lawn is being called the Garden of Life today. Reporter Sydney Glenn finds out what that is and who is being celebrated. Donated a kidney to me, but he also saved five other people's lives. So he's my hero. Today is dedicated to remembering the lives lost and the ones saved by organ donation. The Garden of Life showcases quotes, photos, and special quilts that celebrate the passions of those who died. We have, you know, guitars on some of them, or fishing poles, or sports teams, or anything you can think of that that family feels really celebrates their loved one. Only about 5% of donors' families and recipients will ever meet. Mark Larson is happy to be one of the few. When I recovered from my surgery, I wrote a letter to his family and I told him what it meant to me to get my life back. Larson and his donor's mother met right here at a Donate Life Day. I wanted to know that she's always in my heart. Emotions are high for the families that give life to others as they say goodbye to a loved one. I meet families who in their worst moment, in a moment when they have every right to be selfish and bitter because they've just lost a loved one, 
they make a decision thinking of other people. It's made all the difference in my life to be able to, to travel, to have my life free again. Sometimes a tragedy can give someone a second or even third chance. In Phoenix, Sydney Glenn, Cronkite News. According to the Donor Network of Arizona, there are more than 2.7 million registered organ, eye, and tissue donors here in Arizona. Dining out can be a nice luxury, but with recent E. coli outbreaks, it's important to know what restaurants are doing to keep the food you eat safe. Cronkite News reporter Blake Bernard followed a routine Maricopa County health inspector to take you inside the food quality checks. From places like Subway or even Bowl of Greens here in downtown Phoenix to local establishments all across the valley, food safety is essential for every restaurant and it affects those that eat there. Chefs have an important task. You can kill people if you're not being careful. I mean, people can get extremely sick. Visiting a restaurant is an everyday practice in today's busy world. But if chefs aren't doing their jobs properly, it leads to serious health issues. The recent E. coli outbreak at the popular food chain Chipotle is proof that health safety can be an issue. To prevent outbreaks, both chefs and county health inspectors are involved in making sure the places you visit prepare food properly. There's 53 different components of the health code that we evaluate, but the main ones are going to be things like um, temperatures, cold holding, hot holding, cooking, um, employee sanitation, making sure they're washing their hands. Now, at a restaurant, there's a lot of different ways that food can be mishandled. What are chefs doing to ensure proper food safety techniques, and what can you, as a consumer, be looking for if you decide to go out to eat? When I'm dining at a restaurant, I mean, I'm walking in and I'm, I'm looking at the table, I'm, um, you know, watching my server, uh, are they touching my silverware in a, in a way that they shouldn't be, um, how are they holding the glass when they deliver it to me, you know, when they walk away from the table, are they scratching their face or sneezing or anything like that, and then, then touching the plate that they serve the food. And if you're served undercooked meat or something doesn't seem to be at the right temperature, speak up. Don't be afraid to be that customer. You know, um, obviously we don't want to go into restaurants, we don't want to be rude, we don't want to cause a scene, but at the same time, um, restaurants, uh, food service establishments should be held accountable and they should be serving safe, clean, good quality food. You can also check the most recent health inspection report before you head out to eat. Maricopa County has an app that will let you check. Also, if you do feel sick after eating at a restaurant, report it to the county health department. In downtown Phoenix, Blake Bernard, Cronkite News. One pair of brothers on the Scottsdale Chaparral High School football team have seen the effects of CTE firsthand. Their grandfather, 2016 Hall of Fame inductee Ken Stabler, passed away and was diagnosed with the brain disease soon after. Cronkite News reporter Kerry Crowley tells the story of why these brothers continue to take the field. Brothers Jack and Justin Moyes, football players at Scottsdale Chaparral High School, were in a San Francisco hotel room with their mother on the weekend of Super Bowl 50 when they learned their grandfather, the late Ken Stabler, would be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You never really saw it coming. We were sitting in the hotel room and the President Hall of Fame came and knocked on the door pretty loud and, uh, you know, my heart dropped. Stabler, an NFL MVP with the Oakland Raiders, passed away in July after a bout with colon cancer, but also struggled with memory loss later on in his life. Two weeks before Stabler was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Researchers at Boston University studying the quarterback's brain concluded that he had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, otherwise known as CTE. CTE is a diagnosis based on multiple, multiple poorly treated or untreated head traumas in a genetic susceptible individual that results in neurogenerative disease. Stabler's diagnosis was unsurprising to his grandsons who began noticing memory issues in recent years. You could kind of see it in his everyday life. You know, he'd, he repeated a lot of stories um, that he told you hours before and a day before. While their grandfather's diagnosis changed their viewpoint on the sport, their desire to play the game remains undeterred. There's a risk factor, but you know, it, that's what comes with it. So. Uh, you know, you just can't play. You can't play thinking about it, but yeah, you know, it, it's there. It definitely changed the way I think about it now, but of course when I get on the field, it's not going to matter to me. I just want to, you know, hit someone. The Moyes brothers have seen the risks of football firsthand, but they're excited to continue honoring their grandfather's Hall of Fame legacy on the field this fall. In Scottsdale, I'm Kerry Crowley, Cronkite News. A new study in Cancer Journal recommends that colonoscopy screenings begin at the age of 40 instead of 50 because people are being increasingly diagnosed at a younger age.
Cronkite News reporter Alexis Dominguez gives us a look into why some think lowering that age may help that statistic. I was diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer at the age of 35. Colon cancer had always been part of my life because my father was diagnosed with colon cancer at 46. Kim Newcomer is a cancer survivor who works closely with the Phoenix chapter of Colon Cancer Alliance. After Newcomer was diagnosed with cancer, she was given six months to live, but she has been cancer free for three years. Colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. I alone um, know six people in the last two years under the age of 40 who have died. The study just released in the journal Cancer recommends people get colonoscopies at a younger age. But Surya Kanthgarudu, a gastroenterologist at Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, disagrees and says it is unnecessary to begin screenings earlier than 50. We still don't have uh, large population-based studies that show cost effectiveness by uh, decreasing the age to 40 years. But Dr. Gurudu does agree with one thing. Patients with uh, first degree family members, uh, they should undergo colonoscopy at age 40. Janelle Hill, cancer survivor and chairperson for the Phoenix chapter of Colon Cancer Alliance, was diagnosed at the age of 35 and had no family history of colon cancer. She believes the age for testing should be lowered. A lot of young, younger people are, are passing from this disease, so we need to make a, make a change. Newcomer strongly advises people to be their best health advocate. Um, I just think we need to take the time to take care of ourselves and look out for our own interests. Newcomer says it is also important to ask questions and demand answers. In Phoenix, Alexis Dominguez, Cronkite News. The city of Tempe is working towards being the first dementia-friendly city in Arizona, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Experts say there's about 5 million people living with Alzheimer's and that the number is most likely to rise. Cronkite News reporter Lauren Michaels takes a look at what the city of Tempe is proposing to do. In Tempe, there are about 1,500 people who have dementia. That's according to Mayor Mark Mitchell, who held a forum over the weekend to make Tempe dementia-friendly. Inspired by his own mother, who was diagnosed with the disease, opened his eyes to the importance of educating the community. For us together, I can't, I, I can't imagine not being with him. Sarah and Don Walker have been married for 60 years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Hundreds of years, yeah, hundreds of years. But seven years ago, Sarah Walker was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, yet that hasn't changed their love for each other. As we do our walking, we're always holding hands and we will attract attention frequently about people to say, do you do that always? Yeah, we do. If I don't go with him, I'm just, I just sit there all, all the time, but I, I usually go with him and, and it's good. And on this day's agenda, they attended a Tempe forum on the city's first efforts to be recognized as dementia friendly as part of a national movement. The goal of dementia friendly movement is really to prove that we are a community and that we are not powerless as a community. Banner Health experts say there's about 120,000 people in Arizona with dementia, about 5 million in the U.S., and that number is expected to increase to 15 million by 2050. So it's really about a building awareness and building programs and support systems around affected people and their families. The city of Tempe will be working with the Banner Alzheimer's Institute, hoping to create a plan that could include new signs on restrooms or a one-stop shop for all dementia-related resources. Although it may take time, Don Walker is among many who are happy for the effort. We're here to contribute what we can to the next generation, and hopefully the Banner Alzheimer's does what it says is try to keep the next generation, save the next generation. A doctor from Banner Alzheimer's Institute also said that 50% of people with dementia never receive a diagnosis. The key is to get early checkups to catch the disease in its earliest stage. In the broadcast center, Lauren Michaels, Cronkite News. For students in medical schools across the country, Friday was the most important day of their young careers. Reporter Blake Bernard shows us the emotion of the day and the impact it has on health care in Arizona. For James McKenzie, eight years of education came down to one moment. It's pretty surreal, actually. On Friday, 66 graduating University of Arizona medical students opened long-awaited letters that determined their future in the field of medicine. Until you see it written on paper, it just, you can't imagine the emotion. I 
told myself I wasn't going to cry, but I cried like a baby. <laughs> this is Match Day, where thousands of med students across the country receive residency acceptance letters, and many U of A students are staying in Arizona. It is definitely a big goal to stay in Arizona, and lots of, lots of our students are. 24 U of A students will transition to places like St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center, Mayo Clinic Hospital, and Phoenix Children's Hospital. Still, some had no choice but to leave the valley. We're obviously limited by the number of spots. There are more students going into more specialties than we have in Arizona. Um, and I think there were six emergency medicine uh, students this year, and um, we couldn't all stay in Arizona. Moss and her family will move to Nashville to study emergency medicine at Vanderbilt University, but they may not be gone for good. We definitely plan to come back home. So we get to spend three years pursuing our dreams and then come back home to our family and friends in Arizona. That dream won't be easy. I think the next three years is going to be a lot of hard work, <laughs> um, a lot of long hours in the hospital, um, but it's going to be really great. In Phoenix, Blake Bernard, Cronkite News. The University of Arizona has a perfect match rate through six graduating classes at the downtown Phoenix campus. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. We are proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. When you want to be more connected, friend us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch us online. Become a news source for the Arizona PBS Public Insight Network. Your ideas and insights can help us create relevant and distinctive reporting. Join now at azpbs.org slash pin.